Hello everyone, my name is Asia Velasco and together with Mr. James Laguna, Ms. Lorena Gapoy and Ms. Hardy Barcival, we are going to present to you the challenges and issues in fiscal management in Philippine school. First, let's take a look at the overview of the things that we are going to focus into. The first one is the guiding principles of sound fiscal management system. Second, know the 2021 Department of Education budget allocations. Third, challenges and issues in fiscal management in Philippine school. Fourth, recommendations, suggestions to know the challenges and issues that we are going to enumerate. So, let's start with the guiding principles of sound fiscal management system. So, these eight guiding principles are very important to ensure that the systems, policies, and processes are designed, coordinated, and directed towards student learning and wise investment of the money for education. So let's begin with integrity. So fiscal management practices must be implemented in ways that promote and sustain the integrity of school, district, and community. So there should be no conflict of interest with this part. Second, efficiency. A school district's fiscal management system must use available resources in ways that most directly and effectively meet the educational needs of the students. Here, the resources, allocations, and expenditure should be justifiable in terms of their expected impact on teaching and learning. The third one is educational excellence for all children. The system must support the provision of high quality learning environment opportunities and experiences for this part they should know that they have to recognize the needs of individual students and work towards the attainment of high levels of achievement for all students the fourth one is funding adequacy and equity they must ensure that all schools and programs are provided with sufficient resources to provide quality education to all students. In this part, they should have policies and practices that will ensure the fair distribution of resources to students, taking into account their individual needs and the diverse and unique circumstances of school and school districts. Fifth one is public involvement. Parents and community members have a major stake in how schools and districts use public resources to educate their children and support their communities. In here, accordingly, fiscal management system must offer and encourage opportunities for significant and broad public involvement in process of creating, implementing, and monitoring the budgets. The sixth one is transparency. This is the need for openness by school officials to share information about school finances uh, matters with everyone. So basically, there should be an openness for schools and district um, to develop and implement fiscal management system that provides parents and community members with clear and easy to understand financial and accountability system information. Openness. The seventh one is competence or professionalism. Local and government organizations should require and provide training that will enable individuals to reach a high professional level of competence. And lastly is accountability. There must be guarantee that the processes involved in the administration of public funds are conducted openly and that those involved are held accountable to the highest standards of professional ethics and competence. So the second part is about the 2021 Department of Education budget. So in support of Article Number 14, Section 1 of 1987 Philippine Constitution, which states that the state 
shall protect and promote the right of all citizens to quality education at all levels and shall take appropriate steps to make such education accessible to all. In Section 5 of the said article, it mandates that the state shall assign the highest budgeting priority to education. And in that, the Department of Education covers the biggest portion of the General Appropriateness Act. So for 2021, the Department of Education Office of Secretary covers 13.18% of the national budget. Internally, the budget increased by 41.12 billion or 7.44% from the 2021 budget. So the Department of Education is grateful for the continuous funding support from the government in spite of the economic health challenges brought about by the pandemic. The Department of Education assures that it will utilize the given budget to maximize capacity to implement its POPs for the year 2021 in this challenging period. And this is the original budget allocation for um, the Department of Education to guarantee that the Filipino learners across the nation will have access and receive quality education, 85.73% or about 509.3 billion peso of the budget will go directly to the regions and the remaining 14.27% or 84.8 billion will be managed by the Office of the Secretary to administer the department's program, activities, and projects. So this I highlighted, regions are the one who will get the most amount of money or budget allocation depending on the demand of the teachers and high number of students just like for the region 4a um, it caters to the highest number higher number high number of students and increased demand for teachers so it will receive the most significant allocation representing 9.88 percent of the budget however for the cordillera administrative region or the car will only receive 1.96 percent or 11.64 billion because they have the lowest demand for teachers and also the lowest number of students in the country so the next one is the budget priorities so for 2021 the budget priorities of DepEd includes the following first is continued support to the k-12 program second is the government assistance and subsidy to secondary learners in private schools and additional compensation and professional development for personnel so let's take a look at this um, two priorities uh, more closely so for the k-12 um, the enhanced basic education act of 2013 commonly known as k-12 is the boldest move by the government to promote educational quality in support of this reform to stay true to its battle cry sulong edukalida the department uh, the Department of Education continuously provides resources to support the K-12 program. So these are the plans that the DepEd would like to implement. So first, we can see here they would like to set up school furniture, which is about 1.3 billion. We also have the science and math equipment, which is 2.12 billion. We have the ICT packages, which is 5.66 billion. The pieces of TVL equipment, 5. 594.89 million and textbooks and other instructional materials is 963.26 million while well, for new classrooms to be constructed it's 2.92 billion and then for newly created items for teaching personnel is 1.82 billion and the last one is learners to benefit from SBFP which is 6.49 billion 
so let's um, take a look at the other parts so government assistance and subsidies so we have here the program in the pets um, instrument the program is that it's instrument for collaborating with private schools in delivering quality accessible and relevant education to junior and high school guarantees um, through vouchers so here we could see that we have about 11.24 billion for education servicing contracting we also have 13.69 billion for the voucher program for private university um, private senior high schools and lastly we have additional compensation and per professional development for our personnel to acknowledge the efforts of all teaching and non-teaching personnel um, that they give to the department to serve and deliver quality education to our Filipino learners, DepEd has allocated budget for additional compensation and professional development of the said positions. So we have here um, provision for a special hardship allowance, which is um, 2,152 million. We also have Magna Carta for public health workers which is 584 million we have vision of retirement and terminal leave benefits of mandatory retirees which is 1682 million and other budgets also that has been allocated for teachers and not teacher personnel
Hello everyone, my name is Harty Barcibal and I will continue the issue and challenges in fiscal management in Philippine school. I will focus in the issues regarding the educational system.
When it comes to influence, the educational system of the Philippines have been affected immensely by the country's colonial history including the Spanish period, American period, and Japanese rule and occupation. Although having been significantly influenced by all its colonizers with regard to the educational system, the most influential and deep-rooted contribution arose during the American occupation in 1898. It was during the aforementioned period that English was introduced as primary language of instruction and also a public education system was first established a system specifically patterned after the united states school system and further administered by the newly established department of instruction similar to the united states of america the philippines has had an extensive and extremely inclusive system of education during features such as higher education the present philippine educational system firstly covers six years of compulsory education from grades one to six divided informally into two levels both composed of three years the first level is known as the primary level and the second level is known as the intermediate level however although the philippine educational system has extensively been a model for other southeast asian countries in recent years such a matter has no longer stood true and such a system has been deteriorated such a fact is especially evident true in the country's more secluded poverty stricken regions nationwide the philippines faces several issues when it comes to the educational system these are quality of education budget of education affordability of education drop out rate or out of school use mismatch brain drain social divide and lack of facilities and teacher shortage in public schools first of which is the quality of education in the year 2014 the national achievement test or nat and the national career assessment examination or ncie results shows that there had been a decline in the quality of philippine education at the elementary and secondary levels the students' performance in both the 2014 NAT and NCAE were excessively below the target mean score. Having said this, the poor quality of the Philippine educational system is manifested in the comparison of completion rates between highly urbanized city of Metro Manila which is also happens to be only the country's capital but the largest metropolitan area in the Philippines and other places in the country such as Mindanao and Eastern Visayas. Although Manila is able to boast a primary school completion rate of approximately 100%, other areas of the nation such as Eastern Visayas and Mindanao hold primarily school completion rate for only 30% or even less. This kind of statistic is no surprise to the educational system in the Philippine context. Students who hail from Philippine urban areas have the financially capacity to complete at the very least their primary school education. The second issue that the Philippine educational system faces is the budget for education. Although it has been mandated by the Philippine Constitution for the government to allocate the highest proportion of its government to education, the Philippines remains to have one of the lowest budget allocations to education among ASEAN countries. The third prevalent issue in the Philippine educational system continuously encounters is the affordability of education or lack of of. The big disparity in educational achievement is the evident across various social groups. 
socioeconomically disadvantaged students, otherwise known as students who are members of high and low income and poverty stricken families, have immensely higher dropout rates in the elementary level. Additionally, most freshman students at the tertiary level come from relatively well-off families. Next is dropout rate or out-of-school use. Franz Castro, Secretary of Alliance of Concerned Teachers or ACT, stated that there is a grave need to address the alarming number of out-of-school youth in the country. The Philippines overall has 1.4 million children who are out of school according to UNESCO's data and is additionally the only ASEAN country that is included in the top five countries with the highest number of out-of-school youth. In 2012, the Department of Education showed the data of a 6.38% dropout rate in primary school and a 7.82 dropout rate in secondary school. Castro further stated that the increasing number of out-of-school children is being caused by poverty. The price increases in prices of oil, electricity, rice, water, and other basic commodities are further pushing the poor poverty. Subsequently, as more families become poorer, the number of students enrolled in public schools increases or into dire, especially in the high school level. In 2013, the Department of Education estimated that there are 38,503 elementary schools alongside 7,470 high schools. The next one is mismatch. There is a large mismatch between educational training and actual jobs. This tends to be the major issue at the tertiary level and is furthermore the cause of the continuation of a substantial amount of educated yet unemployed or underemployed people. According to Dean Salvador Belaro Jr., the Cornell educated congressman representing Ang Educacion Party List in the House of Representatives, the number of educated unemployed reaches around 600,000 per year. He refers to said condition as the education gap. Next is brain drain. Brain drain is a persistent problem evident in the educational system of the Philippines due to the modern phenomenon of globalization with the number of overseas Filipino workers or OFWs who work abroad at any time during the period April to September 2014 was estimated at 2.3 million. This ongoing mass emigration subsequently inducts an unparalleled brain drain alongside grave economic implications. Additionally, Philippine society here too is footing the bill for the education of millions who successively spend their more productive years abroad. Thus, the already poor educational system of the Philippines indirectly subsidizes the opulent economists who host the OFWs. The next one is social divide. In terms of educational prospects in the country, there is a problematic and noticeable social division. On the question of education, most modern nations have had an equalizing influence. Because of the aforementioned social difference, education has become a part of the institutional process that generates a separation between the rich and the poor. Lastly, lack of facilities and teacher shortage in public schools. There are large-scale shortages of facilities across the Philippine public schools. These include classrooms, 
teachers, desks and chairs, textbooks, audio and video materials. According to 2003 Department of Education Undersecretary Juan Megaluz, reportedly over 17 million students are enrolled in Philippine public schools and at annual population growth rate of 2.3% or about 1.7 million babies are born every year which means that in a few years time more individuals will assert ownership over their share of the limited educational provisions. To sum it up, there are too many students and too little resources. There is a prevalent difficulty the public school system faces with regards to shortages. Furthermore, State universities and colleges gradually raise tuition so as to have means of purchasing facilities, thus making tertiary education difficult to access or more often than not, inaccessible to the poor. And that's the end of my report. Thank you and God bless. Hello and welcome to the last part of our presentation. This is Jesse James Dagunan, your presenter. And before I start my presentations, I would like first to start my presentations with this quote, Whatever is happening in the country, whatever challenges we are facing, education must continue. Educations cannot wait. Our learners cannot wait. We continue with the process so we can give hope and continuity and contribute to the normalizations of activities in the country. So this is the outline of my presentations. First, I'm going to talk about the DepEd's improved fiscal performance. Second, I'm going to read the uh, Addressing the Philippine Education Crisis. And the last part is three recommendations to support school leaders during the coronavirus pandemic. Part 1. DepEd's improved fiscal performance. The Department of Education affirms that it has already made significant strides in addressing its fiscal challenges. In the burden of a large dip ed budget, Opinion 6918, written by the National Book Development Board Chair Nini Santa Romana Cruz, the impressions of underutilizations is based on figures reported in the July 2017 budget hearing, on which the dip ed was quick to catch up by the December last year. So a three-year comparison of the DepEd's budget utilization shows a steady decline in understanding from 12% in 2015 to 10% in 2016 and finally to only 3% in 2017. This can be attributed to several fiscal management reforms initiated by the agency. In a span of three years, the DepEd has done what it can to address the systemic problems and dysfunctions within the bureaucracy and hurdled the challenges in the budget process. So the agency performance review rating issued by the Department of Budget and Management on May 30, 2018 and the Audit Observation Memorandum on 2017 Budget Utilizations issued by the Commissions of Audit on April 24, 2018 have recognized the DepEd's improved performance at the agency's various level of the governance. Given that increased budget utilization is a function of performance, rest assured that the work will not end here as the DepEd continues to deliver programs and services, accomplish its physical targets, and ensures that deep-seated bottlenecks, challenges, and constraints are fully addressed and eventually eliminated. So the current administration's permission is not just to achieve quality spending but more importantly, to promptly deliver quality, accessible, relevant, and liberating basic education to its 27.7 million and continuously increasing number of learners. This is the part 2, entitled Addressing the Philippine Education Crisis, entitled Human Side of Economics, written by Bernardo M. Villegas. So in addressing the current education crisis, a very crucial institution that we have to establish as clearly as possible is what the Philippine Business for Education's PBED 
is battling for the immediate covening of a multi-sectoral educational commission or EDCOM to seriously address the country's learning crisis without further delay. As envisioned by PBED, PBED the EDCOM should be multi-sectoral with representatives not only from the legislature and executive but also from the academic, business sector, and education interest groups. In addition, it must tackle concerns such as learning outcomes, learning inequities, and the resiliency of the education system while remaining open to reforms such as more decentralized system and the new governance structure. As Lab Baseliot, Executive Director of PBED, wrote in the Philippine Dairy Inquirer, we want an EDCOM that will reimagine and rethink Philippines' educations and will draft a roadmap for the future. The EDCOM will be composed of experts and leaders from the government, business community, civil society, and interest groups. The EDCOM's roadmap is envisioned to be strategic, offering solutions that will lead to systemic reforms towards an inclusive and resilient Philippine education. So this roadmap of, will focus on the key areas of teaching and learning, governance, access and equity, and workforce development. Fortunately, the ball has started rolling when an EDCOM resolution passed the committee level on May 27 in the House of Representatives. The sponsors of the resolutions were Representative Kiko Benitez, Stella Kimbo, Fidel Negrales, Romel Angara, Chairperson Mark Go, Members of Committee on Higher Technical Education and Chairperson Ruman Rumulo, and the, and the Members of the Committee on Basic Education and Culture. If the present legislature is able to pass this EDCOM bill, this government will be remembered by future generations as having started the building of an institution that can significantly address the education crisis that the country has been facing for some time now. It is not enough to attract the best to teach. There must also be serious efforts to uplift the, Im the image of teaching professionals and to support the job placement of qualified te teachers, especially in the primary and secondary public education system. The bill drafted by PBED is aimed to enacting the Teacher Education for Achievers TEACH program provides stronger incentives to develop high achiever students as effective teachers. In the same way that in the business world coaching or mentoring has become a common practice to prepare future generations of business leaders, mentorship will be incorporated in the TEACH program. Prospective teachers have to be prepared academically, socially, and psychologically too. A proven means to do this is through mentorship, which will be at the heart of the TEACH program where grantees will be guided by vetted and qualified mentors. Part 3. Recommendations to support school leaders during the coronavirus pandemic. Whether they are called headmasters, principals, or directors, School leaders play an important motivating and coordinating role in education system's COVID-19 responses. Here are our recommendations to support them in this critical role. Over the past few weeks, school leaders' roles have been unexpectedly and dramatically changed by the COVID-19 crisis. The unprecedented nature of this situation means there is no set directions for them to follow. School leaders are, are like actors in a play where the story, the script, and the costumes have all changed mid-performance and they are on a stage improvising to adjust to their new role. Recommendation 1. Clearly define the role of school leaders in crisis response. A key insight from our survey was that school leaders strongly feel responsible for ensuring the welfare of their students during this crisis. This sense of responsibility can be further utilized to support their communities. It is critical that governments set clear guidelines on what is expected of school leaders and will us providing supports and resources required to perform their roles. School leaders have an important perspective in the challenges faced by their 
communities and their voices should be incorporated when defining the role during this crisis. Globally, our school leaders are most concerned with the students' well-being, online teaching and finances in that order. So recommendation 2, enlist school leaders to lead the process to reopen. So leaders will have to address the following factors. First, mental health and well-being challenges among teachers and students who may have suffered from anxiety, depression, isolation, or malnutrition. Learning losses are among children. We anticipate these losses to be more severe in school that were of lower quality. Third one, loss of students and teachers. We know that in urban areas, migrant workers including teachers have headed back to rural homes during the crisis. Fourth, ensuring adequate supplies with the interruptions in supply chains, things like textbooks, learning materials may be in short supply and it will fall on school leaders to figure out plans for learning to continue. Scheduling and other logistical challenges. Depending upon how controlled the return to fully open communities is, there may be scheduling challenges. For instance, older children may return to school first, followed by the younger children later. Recommendation 3. Develop programs to train and connect school leaders. Through our initial online work with school leaders, one lesson we have we have come to is that a key role for education systems during this time is to connect school leaders in peer groups so that they can rapidly share best practices. The challenges faced by education systems are vast. School leaders are an important layer in the education system that can act as a motivating and coordinating agent to ensure teachers, students, and families are connected to plans made by education officials. Maybe a problem this big doesn't just need a big solution. Maybe it needs a million local community solutions. Thank you and have a good night.